Okay, welcome back everybody. This is uh, VMworld 2013. This is theCUBE live in San Francisco, Moscone South Lobby. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, I'm with Dave Vellante at wikibon.org. George Schlesman is here. Hi everybody. We are excited to have a new segment. Everybody's talking about software-defined you know, uh, uh, data center, and, and George Schlesman is the CEO and product architect of IO. IO.com, go check out the website. Start up in this space. George, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. My first Thank question you. is how'd so, you get a two letter domain name? Yeah, right. so John, I, I want that answer. John is that. a sleuth I, when it comes to these so things. Yeah, the, the entire strategy for me is I wanted the shortest possible email address you can have. So for everyone watching, uh, you know, it's a g at io.com <laughs> if you have a desire to send, you, send me an email. But uh, no, it was a. G -I -O, it, it's going to start flooding your yeah, mailbox. No, people G, that's that's right. g, g at io.com. It's as short as you can get. So. Um, you it, can it run a, a URL shortener business. <laughs> yeah, Damn, that's right. a, a good URL. <laughs> I mean, seriously, did you, how old is that URL? So did it's, you a, buy it's it an or? old. It's an old URL. We actually purchased it from a uh, from a uh, uh, old uh, web hosting company that was in Texas, and so uh, they had had it buried behind layers and layers and layers of email servers and things like that, and had I don't know ten, a couple ten or fifteen thousand email users that were on it, and we just kept kind of. Uh, Pestering them uh, over time, and, okay, and ultimately good. got a hold of it. Good so. acquisition. It's an awesome name, and it, it's a good acquisition. Good use of no, capital for a startup. Yeah, it really from is. From my perspective, I mean, it's one of the most important things we did from a marketing perspective for the company. Yeah, <laughs> I got so. the cube handle on Twitter, but I had to actually wrangle it. You're technically not allowed to buy Twitter handles. Oh, by really? The terms I didn't of know service. that. So we you know it's a game. But anyway, I want to get that out of the way because I've always been intrigued. That's the first question I wanted to ask you when I see you and when I saw you in person. Uh, but let's talk about what you guys are doing. You guys are one of the hottest. Uh, companies right now in the space of data center, uh, data center, the future of the data center. I mean, right now, I mean, I did a post, go Mark Hopkins knows back in 2008, I wrote a post, the internet operating system in the data center where mm -hmm. you know, we talked to HP labs, to sensor networks, using big data, making it a holistic operation. So it's all about the physical plant and the physical assets. Now all the action, software defined data center mm -hmm. with Nasir selling for a billion dollars, all that stuff, great. Software virtual system is great, but still, there's a power problem, there's a footprint problem, the, every facility's guys gets the phone call, a CIO managing the budget, that's your world, right? So tell the folks what yeah. the solution is and, and why you guys are so successful right now. So, so what we've done and what we've endeavored to do, John, is we've endeavored to bring a, the same software enabled optimization that, that you can do at virtually every other layer of the stack day, whether you're at the storage layer, you're at the CPU layer, at network layer, or even above into application platform service, et cetera. We've endeavored to bring that type of flexibility into the physical data center assets and give you the ability to manage those assets in a way that correlates those to the workloads utilizing them. So data centers traditionally, <clears throat> you know, have been managed in a facilities-based approach, they've been construction delivered, and, and, and we had a very strong view that that paradigm had to break if we were going to be able to take full advantage, we meaning the, the global cloud you know, movement. Is going, if you want full benefit of the cloud, you have to have a data center that can react to the cloud the same way that the cloud can react to the data center. So if you think of what Google or Amazon or, or uh, Microsoft or others have been able to achieve by matching their data center infrastructure up with the application infrastructure that runs inside of it, the efficiencies that they get access to, we can deliver those same types of efficiencies at an enterprise scale rather than at a web scale. Um, and, and how we do that is we carve the data center up into modular units that we manufacture, so you can now break bulk with the data center, you can buy just the amount that you need at any given time, and then by standardizing that delivery footprint and manufacturing a standardized interface for physical data center, we were then able to coordinate that through an operating system called the IOS, which brings all of the attributes that VMware or a virtualization platform delivers at the server level, we now can deliver at the individual data center level as well. So, so thin provisioning, thin slicing, um, real-time optimization, dynamic control, and I'll give you one example of a real-world work or use case that a customer's running today is, during trading hours, run a data center for resiliency and security, off trading hours, run it for efficiency and cost. And we can do that through software, rather than having to do that through physical design. So dial up or dial down the resources that you need for, for the data center, the physical resources right. in a granular fashion. Right, and so the, the, what I kind of joke about is, so we're at an event here talking about software-defined data center, but no one's talking about the data center, right? So, <laughs> you know, strangely enough, <laughs> CPU storage network devices, we, we do an extraordinarily, I think, good job today of managing and, and optimizing. Application layer, we're getting better at. Data, we're still struggling with, how we think about managing data in a, in a really smart way. But the data center, they've done nothing with. 
Like we, the, the industry in general still goes to a facilities team or to a real estate guy to try to solve the data center requirement. And the data center represents for a given organization, enterprise scale organization, anywhere between 15 and 35% of their operating budget on IT side is the physical data center. Yeah, I mean most people, take us through that because also not only is that the wrong people talking about data center, real estate, and facilities guys looking for space, they're not tech guys, right? So, and, and it increases the cycle of deployment. So just, the people mostly have these problems when it's like they run out of room, right? So take us through what you guys run into all the time with your, where you guys are knocking it out of the park. Absolutely. So, so Two advantages our technology platform brings for our customers. As a customer is going through the process of, of growing or uh, maturing into a cloud construct or a cloud uh, uh, utility model for, for compute, the data center tends to very quickly highlight itself as a boat anchor to that process. That, that they have this huge, enormous capital investment into this static resource, this static asset, that they can't modify and change on a real-time basis, right? Whereas everything else in the stack is going to a pay-per-drink model, or a utility-based model, or a commodity, vanity-free, open architecture. The data center re remains this very, very, you know, monolithic, static component. And so what we typically run into with customers is it gets expressed as we ran out of space, or it gets expressed as we ran out of power, or it gets expressed by we don't need that asset anymore because its usefulness has run out to us. And, 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 and what we do is we then work with the customer to say, how do you rationalize that? And how do you take a step back? And, and instead of making the data center decision on an enterprise scale, to make the data center decision on an application scale. So if you think about one of the real quantum shifts that have occurred as we went from mainframes to PC servers and now to cloud, at the mainframe, in the mainframe world, you made the IT decision on an absolute enterprise scale for everything. Operating system, hardware, applications, all ran in one device for the whole enterprise, right? As we matured into a PC server world, then we could make the decisions for that part of the stack. We really had a bifurcation, right? That part of the stack became an application-based decision making, mm -hmm. and the hardware and the data center still remained an enterprise decision. The cloud is now allowing us to mature to a place where we can actually make almost call-by-call -call decisions about how we access resources. But again, the data centers remain completely static through this process. Mm -hmm. And so the, the burden of the data center ends up showing up in these kind of four basic attributes for most companies today. One, they take way too long to deliver. The cycle times don't match up to consumption times and IT cycles. The, the burden of the cost on a unit basis and an aggregate is going up year over year, and there's no way to rationalize it at a finite enough scale to be able to be proactive do or reactive it, yeah. or even do it. I mean, you can't do anything about it, right? Yeah. Some of these assets, God forbid, some of these assets are booked on, on, on our customers' balance sheets on 30-year depreciation cycles. Right. Could you imagine if a, a Spark server was on a 30-year depreciation cycle, like what the outcome of that is for the world? I got my vax over yeah, here. Yeah, right, yeah, it's all good. It's still, we're still depreciating, it's useful. Um, you know, and, and so those are, those are how they're expressed. There's also an underlying security problem with traditional data center environments, and that has to do with the um, the systems that are used, the software systems used to control physical data centers are building automation systems. Like literally like they were built to control air conditioners in office buildings, not to control data center environments. And so they, they typically aren't part of Active Directory or LDAP or any type of single sign-on service. They're not part of the information security stack for an enterprise. And strangely enough, if you shut down one of those devices, you can shut down everything in the data center. So, so you said 15 to 35% of the, the operating budget is the facilities, right? Correct. that right? So how do you affect that? Um, so you're talking about the power bill with well, the there's two, there well, there's well, two right? components. So, so there's the inside of, if you want to express it all as operating expense, there's a portion of it that's depreciated right, or capital expense that's depreciated over yeah, time. Okay. So and then there's, then there's the operating component of itself, right? Okay. So that's energy consumption typically, it's personnel, it's all of the components that roll up into it. We, we affect it significantly two ways. First of all is the stair step process of, of procuring data center, we break into much smaller chunks, right? So instead of having to spend $100 million on a new data center facility, you can in fact spend one, you can buy one module if that's all the capacity you need, which could be cut the expense from 100 to a million dollars, let's say. The second is by using our software, you can be much smarter about how you use and consume that service. The underlying hardware is more efficient in its design and the software lets you run it more efficiently so you can see operating expense costs come down significantly. Energy, we just published a report that was uh, 
validated by uh, uh, Arizona Public Service at one of our hosting uh, sites in Arizona, which is the public utility. Um, a 44% re reduction in operating energy costs and operating expense from traditional white wall to our modular approach. And that was third party validated, we published the report. Not our numbers, their numbers, right? They used our numbers to do it. But at the end of the day, 44%, this is an enormous operating advantage mm -hmm. just on energy consumption yeah, that I mean, you can see. I mean, if you can go in and drop in and scale out data centers without all those hassles and then make them integrate in, it's a total home run. Well, and, and John, the second point to this that I think is further to the cloud point, what we're, what we're, we're here at VMworld about is, how do you then scale that from your premise to a hosted premise, to a hybrid model, to a private model, to a public model. How do you start thinking about, on an application basis, managing security, managing transparency, managing access for an enterprise, how do you scale out? And so, so our what footprint, are your top customers doing? So what are you, with, that, with that point, what yeah. are your top customers? Give an example of your top customers. So uh, our, our largest global customer today is Goldman Sachs. Um, publicly disclosed, branding's on our website, and et cetera. So I, I feel for, you know, free you to be discussing uh, their name and what they're doing. They've looked at our platform and at this point in time are committing to taking every part of our product set. So from our eco product, which is a high efficiency product, to our operating system running on top of those products, to our core product running in our hosted sites, not even on their premise, but in a hybrid private environment. Um, so at the, of, at the end of the day, they have elected to take every component of our product set and deploy it inside of their IT stack as a cornerstone foundation on that. Talk about the company, you're, the, you get, you're an entrepreneur. Um, I mean, it's hard, you've been very successful. <laughs> I mean, talk about the journey and, what, well, and how it all got started. As a Zen, it's a master, great as a Zen master says, you'll, you know, we'll see as, as it all pans out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's looking good yeah, off the tee. Yeah, it's looking good at this, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm right. in the fairway, so we'll, we'll leave it at Don't that. Don't screw the approach. Yeah, right, so you know, I, I, I've been an entrepreneur my entire career. My brother and I have worked together from our very first business, which we started in uh, the bedroom of our, uh, actually his bedroom, I have to admit, in, uh, in, at, when we were at, at university. Um, first business in the application software development space, we were fortunate enough to sell to a public company. Um, we then started our first foray into the data center space and really in the traditional wholesale retail collocation model um, in the early 2000s. Um, had an opportunity to exit that business also to a public company, but really that was the moment where we said, these two worlds have to come together. Like, you can't have a facilities approach and you can't have an IT approach that, that's taking separate trajectories, and we said we had to bring those together. And in 2007, we started IO as, another, as our third startup. I mean, back to the folding tables and three guys around in a room. Um, <laughs> so that's Part. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's funny. You're I was hungry, gonna, you're hustling, <laughs> you're rubbing no, nickels you know together. I mean, exactly, and I, I, scrappiness is, is core to our DNA and what we do because that entrepreneur, being scrappy for your customers is a powerful thing, yeah. um, and being smart and And thoughtful. you guys self-funded. Right? Yeah, so. You had your own my, dough into it, and our, then you self-funded yeah, it. We self-funded the business to start, and then we brought institutional capital in since then. Um, but you were clear the runway by then, right? On the product? Or oh, yeah. Or did you bring in the capital? We, we brought in capital. First capital raise we did was in uh, 2009, so. So two so we years were in. two years into the business um, before we brought in uh, third party institutional yeah, capital at that right. point in time. We're, we're approaching, we're north of 400 employees today. We have about north of 500 customers globally. We have uh, operations in Singapore, uh, where we have a hosting site for our technology, Phoenix, Ohio, New Jersey, and we'll have a site uh, coming online in, in the UK in, in next year. Yeah. Um, so that's where we can host our technology for customers. Then we have modules at this point deployed you know, across the country and, and internationally on behalf of so customers. So what's the outlook look like? Obviously it's a trend. I mean, people are busting out. They still need data centers. Um, they, need a, they, they need data centers everywhere. So, so how is the outlook for the business? What do, what do you see? You know, look, at the end of the day, there's going to be more applications tomorrow than are today. Um, I, and I think that the, how those applications are, get deployed is getting smarter, and, and enterprises who are primary focus are enterprise customers. So I'm mean, not that we don't have web scale customers, we don't have government, but our core focus are the big enterprise scale customer. There's a few trends that these folks are focused on what I think are driving everything. Lock-in, no lock-in. They, they will not survive lock-in anymore. They will not accept it. Vanity free, they do not want to pay taxes for brands, right? I mean, there's these underlying trends that, that are clearly maturing in, in the space, and I think that anyone that can show up with a smart solution that's innovative and has a roadmap for progressively getting better is going to win. And, and I think that we're fortunate to be positioned well, there's, well there's, in the there's space. There's a lot of carnage in the data center expansion. One, that's getting the space. That's, 
you know, a facilities guy, real estate guy, that's kind of slow and not the right expertise too. Putting it all together, like I was saying, this operating system model, it's basically an engineered operating environment now. Every, every component has to work together. So, so, so I want to know more about like that. We were talking about Flash, so take Flash. Yep. What's, what are the inner engine components? Share with you your vision of that operating environment oh, so and, and the benefits of absolutely. it. Absolutely, so you, what, what I, so the, the vision for the data center from my perspective is this has to be commoditized. The data center infrastructure layer where we play all the way up through the enterprise infrastructure stacks so of CPU network storage has to be commoditized. There is no way that we can survive at scale without commoditization at that layer, period, end of story. The number of components in that layer have to be minimized, and I mean the physical component count has to come down. The, I believe the only moving component that can be in the CPU storage network data center layer, how we view the world, can be fans, that's it. Disks aren't going to be spinning, chillers aren't going to be spinning, generators aren't going to be spinning, UPSs aren't going to be spinning, all of that over time so has to go We just heard our away. previous guest talk about specialized hardware, and I mean, exact opposite when, story, and I mean, I was surprised I, you know, to hear I, it, but I, you're, you're like saying, no I, way, it, won't survive, won't it, scale. It, the problem is it doesn't, it, customers don't want custom, because yeah. custom equals expensive. Right, at every turn. Custom equals someone's proprietary lock-in yeah. um, that they want to hold you, you know, hold your feet to the fire on. Um, I see that if you look at where anyone who's achieved scale in data center, look what they look like. Yeah. Facebook, open compute, Google, white label. They, they built, built their own. own. They, they, they built and their and own. so we describe it two ways. We bring web scale to any scale. So if you want web scale and a web scale approach to infrastructure mm. at any scale, we can do that. And the second thing is, the future is that module, the data center, is yeah. the computer. Yeah, remember the old DMZ uh, era, you know, it's the DMZ and it's the extranet, all that stuff. You guys could literally drop in a hybrid, hybrid cloud tomorrow. Yeah, private, hybrid, absolutely tomorrow. Just 90 days in, delivery. 90 day delivering, fully contained, and Absolutely. engineered. And, and a serialized that, bill of- Did I get that right? Yes, and a serialized bill of materials from a support maintenance warranty perspective, which is important for a large enterprise. Like, you can't just drop in Does something Does the customer order their own gear, or did you just decide for them? Uh, we give them the optionality. They can, we'll provide it as a service, either IS, PASS, or DCAS, um, or they can take it as an on-premise owned asset, or we'll host an owned asset in our site too. What's the biggest thing people don't understand about your business out there? Always, we are, Dave and I were talking earlier about this, there's always naysayers, and the big booming companies like yours that are growing, there's always people who don't get it. I don't get it. I, yeah. I, I, I What's think the what, big thing that people don't I, get? I think what people don't get is that the data center isn't real estate, and I think there's, a, there's an, <laughs> there's an entor, <laughs> when you say software defined data center here, no one thinks construction companies no, and right. shovels and, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, they don't. Yeah, yeah. Power and cooling. Because they're right. <laughs> These are the people who use data centers and data centers are what happens inside of them. And, and I think the biggest misconception to this, the, the space is that somehow a, a, a building is going to be relevant to the cloud in the future, it just isn't the case. How, you, how you're operationalizing cloud infrastructure is going to be relevant and that should be outdoors or indoors, it could be at any, any type of location. The second thing is the software integration component I think is, a, is, is discounted and shouldn't be. Um, and I wouldn't say discounted, it's just not well understood. We have built a, 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 a platform that allows any advanced orchestration engine from a service mesh who's doing some incredible things in managing policy-based policy organization at top level to uh, Cloud Foundry and Paul Moritz and the team out there are doing some extraordinary things with you know, open components of that, open stack, other things, all of these things in the stack are building a construct where you should be able to dynamically control infrastructure second by second, call by call, and that's from the data center all the way to the top. And, and our software platform allows what v VMware did for the server, we do for the data center itself. And, and between those two things, once you decide the data center's technology and it should be optimized by software, you understand what we do. Do you do it all end to end? So you do the assembly, construction, and integration, and software? One of the things I'm most proud of, of, of our company and, and at a personal level is we've created 100 plus manufacturing jobs in, in the United States this year. We've built and manufactured our modules in a factory in Chandler, uh, which is an extraordinary site. We do tours there if anyone wants to come visit. Um, and Arizona? Our, in Arizona, Chandler, Arizona. We, I, saw, I, I tweeted a picture earlier this year of our modules being unloaded off a ship in Singapore. Right? There's nothing cooler in the world than seeing yeah. a, something made US. in the United States <laughs> shipped <laughs> to Asia and unloaded. How many other companies in this venue can talk about how many of their products were built here in the US and shipped to Asia, right? I mean, it's exactly the opposite in every case. So, you know, that's one of the things we're most proud of. So we have all of the engineering resources internal. We have uh, an applied analytics team 
that takes the data we collect from all of our customers. We have about uh, 20 plus billion rows of data we've collected um, in the metadata from the operating of our technology and customer sites that we do deep analytics against and then help our customers get better mm -hmm. and help our product teams get better at engineering. So, no, it's, it, it, are you guys, how fast are you guys growing right now? So you're adding, you look actually hiring, right? <laughs> yeah, so what yeah, are you looking no, for? I, so two years ago we were less than 100 people and we're 400 plus today. We're hiring uh, roughly a person a day right now from a, Who, from what do you, what's the kind of people you're looking to hire right now? Uh, engineers and salespeople. Um, anyone who is an engineer, and, and the neat thing about our engineering effort is it's from hardcore mechanical, electrical, thermal, all the way up through software, so we really have this completely integrated stack, cloud engineering. Yeah. You need all kinds of engineers, mechanical engineers, all kinds of systems engineers, yeah, pro software, Materials, applied robotics, I mean all these sorts of things. George, really great story. I'm really glad you came on theCUBE. Uh, I was telling Dave, you know, we'd love to have startups on, but we founder-led companies are always our favorite because you know what, you, you, you start, you scrap together, you put it together, you fund it, you build it, and actually you raise money to grow and you know, scale up into cruising altitude. I but, appreciate that, John. But you know, look at Michael Dell, he's going private. He's going to have three quarters of Dell, he's going to take it back. And so, you know, I, I predict we move into a trend of founder-led startups, uh -huh. and you can see more and more of that, uh, and you only go to VCs when you need the cash, right? That's we care. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you can. Of course, I'm biased. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, yeah, I think you're right. I'm, like, I'm, I'm the biggest, I, I, I'm one of the, I, I, ownership I think breeds every responsible behavior we want, right? Yeah. From leadership to, to caring, I mean, like I said, I care. Yeah. I get up every day and I care about my team. I see a bunch of them yeah. sitting out here. I care about their two, you know, two thousand indirect employees and family members, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, well awesome. congratulations. No, Thanks thank for coming you. on theCUBE. Yeah, we are here live in uh, San Francisco. Go to io.com, check them out. Uh, changing the data center for the better. Obviously, the data center doesn't exist without one. I mean, you can't have a software defined <laughs> data center without an actual data center. And we know that everyone has power and cooling, huge issues in the data center, massive growth, still an issue. So Absolutely. facilities are exploding and they need to be mon monitored and managed, so go to I.O. This is SiliconANGLE The Cube with Vicky Bond, Dave Vellante. I'm John Furrier, we'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.